Okay, let's talk about the um, Texas Judicial Branch. This is the third branch of government, um, Texas government. So we had the executive, we had the um, legislative, and now the judicial. Again, the 35,000 foot view. Legislative makes the laws, the House and the Senate, the executive enforces the laws, the governor, lieutenant governor, and the judicial interprets the laws, which is the judges. And um, I'm not going to lie, this is my favorite branch of government. Um, and yes, I do have a favorite. So let's talk about um, the courts. And I want to um, go through, there's not very many slides in this discussion, but I want to go through a whole lot of information because I want to debunk some myths that um, I think people have um, if they've not been to law school or they've not um, had a, an experience with the um, court system. So there are two different kinds of courts. There's a civil court and a criminal court. So um, when you talk about there's you know two sets of laws, there's civil law and criminal law. So um, when you talk about different courts and different laws, there's, um, there's differences, there's lots of differences in the punishments, whether it's civil versus criminal. So a civil court um, will hear a case where the penalty for um, whatever is being complained about is either somebody paying money to another person or uh, to the state um, or stopping some action. So the court can't make you do something um, because that's, you know, involuntary servitude. Um, they can't make you work for somebody um, if you signed a contract, but they can make you pay money um, and they can make you stop doing some action if you're doing it. Like if you're infringing on somebody's, um, on somebody's intellectual property. Now in a criminal case, the penalty will be incarceration meaning you're going to lose your freedom or lose your life um, for the violation of whatever um, law that you have committed. The um, burden of proof in a civil case is a preponderance of an evidence standard. And what that means is basically if there are two scales, um, the person in order to win, the person who is bringing the claim um, must make the scales tip just infinitesimally in their favor. So it doesn't have to be, you know, um, by an overwhelming show of evidence or anything like that. It just has to be just a tiny bit more evidence that something happened versus did not happen. Now, in a criminal case, the stakes are a lot higher because you may lose your life, you may lose your liberty, and so the, um, the burden of proof is beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, sometimes you'll hear on um, TV shows or in movies that somebody will say they were guilty beyond a shadow of a doubt, or you're not going to be able to show beyond a shadow of a doubt that I did something. Well, that's not the standard. It's not a shadow of a doubt. It's just beyond a reasonable doubt. So that means there can be some doubt as to whether or not somebody did something, but um, it has to be not reasonable doubt. So it has to be, um, you know, beyond a reasonable doubt that, um, that somebody committed a crime or um, committed an act. Um, so an example that I like to use is um, if, if um, somebody is um, driving drunk and they um, hit another car and um, nobody was around. It was just these two cars on the road and drunk driver, car number one, hits car number two and um, everyone, you know, like everyone in car number two dies, the drunk driver gets up runs away um, and, you know, runs home before anybody catches them, before anybody discovers the wreck. Now, um, is there a doubt that that um, driver, drunk driver, actually committed the, um, 
the action that, you know, of, of driving drunk and, and running into the other car, well, yeah, there's doubt. But the evidence has to show you whether the doubt you have is reasonable or not. So if the argument is, okay, a bunch of people at a party saw drunk driver getting into car number one, they saw a drunk driver drive away in car number one, and then um, they saw that um, nobody else was in the car, nobody else was driving, and later when they discover drunk driver at home, um, he doesn't have his car, his head is all bashed up, and he's, um, you know, passed out with a, with a high blood alcohol level. Now, you can doubt that he was in the car, but it's, there's not a reasonable doubt that he committed the crime. Um, because the drunk driver can say, well, yeah, but actually I was driving and then I was abducted by aliens. And so aliens got in my car and they're the ones who caused the crash. And then when they returned me to Earth, they, um, they deposited me into my house. And also in this whole situation, when I was abducted, they bashed me in the head. Well, that's not a reasonable, um, you know, that's an unreasonable doubt. So, um, so in that scenario, with that evidence, you can see how the jury would find beyond a reasonable doubt that um, the drunk driver committed the accident. Um, so if you're in civil case, in a civil case, in a civil court, um, the person who is um, in trouble will be found liable or responsible. Um, if the person who brought the case um, succeeds in their improving their case beyond a, you know, in a, to a preponderance of the evidence standard. In a criminal case, the person will be found guilty or not guilty. Now, something that's very important for you to remember is that um, a person will not be found innocent. So if you hear um, somebody report that Yes, um, you know, he was charged with drunk driving, but he was found innocent. Well, no, that's not a thing. Um, maybe you're found not guilty of drunk driving, but courts don't take that extra step to proclaim someone as innocent. They can say nobody proved you were guilty, but they're not going to say that you're innocent. That's just, that is not a thing. Um, in civil court, the people who are there will be called the plaintiff. That's the person bringing the case, bringing the complaint against the defendant. And that's the person who's defending themselves from the complaint. In a criminal case, it'll be the state or the prosecutor who brings the case against the defendant. So in both, both instances, the person who is defending themselves, who is you know, the, the person who's trying to proclaim that they're not guilty or not liable is called a defendant. So you may be thinking, what if I get called into court and I didn't do anything wrong? I am innocent. Um, what's, you know, what, how do I prove that or what do I do? Well, there are safeguards in place in the system that um, protect you if you um, if you, from being hauled into court for something that you had no um, no responsibility for no um, involvement in um, in a civil case that would be a motion to dismiss or a motion for summary judgment um, if you get through trial and you know you haven't been able to prove through a motion to dismiss or a motion for summary judgment that you um, absolutely have no reason to be in court, then you can bring a motion for directed verdict. And then what if it goes all the way through the, to, a, to jury trial and the jury finds you liable for a million dollars, but the judge knows that you were wrongfully um, dragged into court, the judge can issue a judgment notwithstanding the verdict, the JNOV, which means he can set aside the jury's verdict. It's almost like a mini appeal right there. Um, in a criminal case, the um, protections are 
more upfront. And so the, one of the protections is that a criminal case requires that um, a grand jury first look at the case and see if there's enough evidence for the case to be um, prosecuted, for the case to go forward. Because if the grand jury looks at the evidence and says, there's really not a case here, um, then you can't be tried for that crime. Now, if you do go through, the grand jury says that that you can go to trial, um, the, the state has evidence against you, and um, you make it all the way through the first part of trial where the state lays out all their best evidence against you, then um, you can still say, judge, they have not proved their case against me, and um, I need you to issue a directed verdict. And if the judge agrees with you, then, then you have a directed verdict and you're done. Um, the burden of proof is always on the person who's claiming the injury. So if the plaintiff says, um, in a civil case says, um, hey, I'm your, you know, my house was, was um, damaged because your tree from your yard fell on it. Well, then the plaintiff would be my neighbor um, who's claiming that their house was damaged. And the defendant would be me, who's, who's the person that has the tree. Um, if it was a criminal case, then and somebody is saying that um, I should be charged for um, drunk driving, then the, the state who is saying that I violated the law would have the burden of proof. Um, the party that has the burden of proof goes first and goes last because they have, they have the uphill battle. They um, have to show that um, their side is correct. Um, the defendant in either a criminal or a civil case does not have the burden to prove their innocence or um, that they're not guilty or they don't have to find the real responsible party. Um, so in my drunk driving analogy, um, if I am the defendant, I don't have to find the real person that, um, that committed the accident. Um, I just have to um, sit back and hope that the, plain, the, that the state does not prove their case against me. So um, sometimes you'll see in movies or on TV that um, the court will say, well, unless you can tell me who is really responsible, then you're responsible for this um, injury or this you know, money. Um, and that's not true. That's not, you know, nobody, um, nobody has to do that. If you don't win at the trial court level, so the first time that somebody hears your case, um, then you can appeal the case um, multiple times usually. And so um, there's that safeguard in place too. So let's talk about um, courts of original jurisdiction versus courts of appellate jurisdiction. So the original jurisdiction will be the trial court, and that's going to be the first place that the case is heard by a judge um, or a jury or both. Um, the trial court will preside over the case until the case is either finished, the trial's finished, or the case is moved to another court. The um, fact finder, either the judge, if you're doing what's called a bench trial, or the jury, um, weighs the evidence, and they listen to evidence, they listen to witnesses testify, and they either find that um, the person is guilty or not guilty or liable or not liable and then as soon as that um, finding is made then the jurisdiction for the court is over and it's out of their hands they've done their job and it's over now if the losing party thinks that there was a bad outcome 
then the losing party can appeal to an appellate court. And that court hears a case after there's already been a full trial, somebody has listened to the evidence, listened to the witnesses, and determined whether or not somebody was guilty, not guilty, liable, not liable. And what the appellate court does is reviews the record, so looks at all the evidence, looks at all the testimony in court, all the arguments in court, and determine if there's any errors that were committed by the court. So did the court, the original court, um, not let a certain witness testify that would have changed the outcome? And the reason they didn't let him testify was, was a bad reason or no reason at all. Um, did the court let um, somebody testify that everybody knew was lying? And um, so they allowed this evidence that should not have been allowed. And so the court looks at the record and determines if there was a violation of law. There's no witnesses that are allowed to present evidence at the appellate court. There's no, there's no um, concrete evidence that is produced. Um, the only thing that the court can look at is what is contained in the written record. And at the end of the appeal, the court will either affirm, so saying that the trial court was fine, everything that happened at the trial court was fine, we're, we would agree with everything that happened. They can reverse and remand, meaning the trial court really screwed up here and we're gonna send it back to the trial court to, to do a better job next time. Um, and so then the case is tried again, or they can reverse and render, saying the trial court really screwed up, and actually, um, you know, this is uh, this is the verdict that should be entered. So that's um, those are the things that can happen in an appellate court. So let's go through an example because I think this is a little bit easier. Um, believe me, this lecture is so much easier in person because we can really go through different kind of what ifs and um, answer questions and um, it's it's much more fun but i think that using examples is um, is really important so let's say that batman is fighting crime and in the course of you know chasing the criminal he runs over john doe's car and he kills john doe's wife who's sitting in the passenger seat of the car so there is a case in a civil court where John Doe sues Batman and you can sue him for negligence or gross negligence or wrongful death saying everything you did was not a reasonable way to act. John Doe has to prove um, that Batman was liable by a preponderance of the evidence. So John Doe just has to prove like 51% that um, that Batman was acting in a way that was unreasonable. And if John Doe wins, he can get money damages for his property. He can get money for um, the loss of his household suffer his household services and his loss of consortium with his wife. So all the sadness that he feels. Um, because of not being able to have his wife there, not being able to have a physical relationship with his wife, not having his wife there to help him um, mow the lawn or you know whatever household services the wife provided. Um, and then he can also um, sue for pain and suffering. So those are the soft damages, the, what, how sad he was. Um, now there can be another um, suit in criminal court, which is the state of Texas versus Batman, and that's where the prosecutor, the state um, attorney, charges Batman with murder or manslaughter in um, running over and killing um, John Doe's wife. Um, the state must prove that Batman was guilty of this crime beyond a reasonable doubt. So not beyond a shadow of a doubt, just beyond a reasonable doubt. And if um, he's found guilty, Batman can spend time in prison. Now, in this, um, 
in this example in the court of original jurisdiction, the court um, or the trial court, the court would hear the evidence about um, Batman's wreck. They would listen to witnesses who saw Batman's actions. Um, they would look at documents about, um, you know, the different damages that were caused. Um, maybe if somebody was um, gave a statement, an eyewitness statement written down, they would listen to experts um, to say things like, how sad was Mr. Doe? And, um, you know, how fast was, was Batman traveling? Was that reasonable? Was it not reasonable? Um, and then a judge or a jury would make a determination about whether Batman was, was liable if it was a um, civil case or guilty in um, the criminal case. And then a verdict would be entered. Either Batman would be found liable and, you know, a certain amount of money would be attached to that, or um, he would be found guilty and a certain sentence would be attached to that, like a certain number of years in jail. Now, if um, that Batman is found liable and guilty, but he thinks that he is completely not, um, not guilty, not being fairly treated, then he can appeal his case to the court of appellate jurisdiction. And what Batman's attorneys would do was send the entire um, record of the trial, so everything that was written down as spoken throughout the entire trial, including all of the pieces of evidence that were entered into um, the record, and um, they would send that to the appellate court and show, say, why the trial court got it wrong. Mm -hmm. Did the trial mm -hmm. court allow a um, witness to testify who was obviously lying? Did the um, trial court um, allow a piece of evidence in that was prejudicial, meaning um, it was was um, just to make the jury sad and upset and didn't have any kind of value to the case. Um, and the court would review that record, review the briefs, which are the arguments written down by, by the counsel, and um, determine if the trial court's verdict should be reversed and remanded. So Batman, you're not liable, you're not guilty. Um, we're gonna send this case back to the trial court and we're going to start over um, whether it should be reversed just saying you know look they really screwed up here obviously Batman you're not guilty you're not liable and the judgment is reversed or they would affirm it say look we looked at everything with the um, you know under the different standard of care and we see that um, everything was fine by the trial court so the the verdict is affirmed So in civil cases, there's one kind of jury, the trial jury. Um, in criminal cases, though, there are two kinds of juries. There's the grand jury, and then there's the um, pettit jury or the trial jury. Um, in civil cases, the jury can be six or 12 people. Um, they hear the evidence and determine whether the person's liable or not liable. And if the person is liable, they determine the amount of money damages. Now, if you're in a civil case, you can waive your right to trial by jury, and you can say, um, no, I just want the judge to hear this case. Um, and, and that's perfectly fine, and there is no jury. In a criminal case, there are two juries. So there's a grand jury that hears just one side of the evidence, and determines whether there's enough evidence to go to trial. So basically says, state, give me your best shot at why you should be able to um, prosecute this person and make this person um, go to court and defend themselves. Um, and after hearing that, if they think that there's not enough evidence, then they will, um, they will what's called no bill the case um, and there won't be a trial. But if the grand jury says there is enough evidence, then the 
case can go to trial and a person will be entitled to a trial by jury who will listen to, um, it's called the pettit jury or the trial jury, and they will listen to the evidence from both sides and determine whether the um, person is guilty or not guilty. Now, again, you can waive this right to trial by jury and just have a judge um, listen to your case um, instead of a pettit jury or a trial jury, but you're not going to waive your right to a grand jury. Now let's talk about jury selection. Jury selection is something that is immensely, immensely important um, for our system of justice to work, but it is something that is often a lot of waiting and kind of boring. And so um, it is something that I, you know, if you are called for jury duty, you need to go. Um, and it could be interesting. You could get to hear a really exciting case. Um, you may hear a really boring case. You may hear a long case. You may hear a short case, but it is really important. So um, what happens in jury selection is that um, a jury panel or a veneer, which is um, just a group of people, is summoned from the driver's license rolls. So remember, not from the voter registration rolls. So you still can register to vote. Um, if you don't have a driver's license, we'll be able to avoid um, jury service. Um, if you are summoned to um, jury selection, you absolutely must show up. Now, Texas, um, being the Wild West that we are, um, I have witnessed judges um, call roll during jury selection and if whoever is has not shown up for jury duty will um, instruct the bailiff to go find the person who didn't show up bring them back to court and in front of everyone who's st sitting there maybe a hundred people sometimes will question that person as to why they thought they were so good that they did not have to show up and they could absolutely disregard the court's order to show up for jury duty. Sometimes they'll find that person. Sometimes they'll make them just show up for jury duty um, another way. Um, sometimes they can put them, they can hold them in um, contempt of court, which can be um, incarcerated for a little while. So it's super serious. You got to show up for jury duty period. Um, the person, the panel, which is just a group of people sitting there waiting for jury selection, sometimes will fill out a questionnaire. Um, sometimes it'll say things like, it'll, it'll just kind of try to short circuit the jury selection process. So it will ask you things like, tell me where you work, where your family, you know, your spouse works, who lives in the house with you. Um, what, you know, have you ever been injured in a certain way that's kind of similar to the way the person in the case has been injured? Um, you know, do you work for a big company? That kind of thing. What is your thought about insurance and um, those kinds of things? And that just lets the lawyers know a little bit about you so that they can um, make a good decision as to who is um, the best fit for that case. Now, it's very important that you be very truthful on those questionnaires and they will tell you that that information is not um, released. So once you fill out that questionnaire, then a lot of times they're not even allowed to leave the courtroom. Um, they're not allowed to be digitized most of the time and um, they'll be thrown away um, and so are shredded. Um, and so you really should be very um, specific on your jury questionnaire. Um, prospective jurors are seated in order. So back in the day, they would um, they would just take all of the cards of people who were um, called to jury duty. They would shuffle them and they would say, you know, juror number one or panel member number one, you sit here and on down the road. Um, a lot of times you get seated, everybody is seated, and then somebody will ask um, for the panel to be shuffled. So, for example, if I um, represent a big bad criminal who was accused of 
um, beating a little old lady and stealing her purse, and I look at the jury as they're seated in order, and I see the first five people on, um, you know, on the first row are little old ladies, um, I'm probably going to ask that that panel be shuffled so that it's a little bit more random. Um, each side is able to give brief introductions, and that's um, this is done differently in all different courts, and it's really just judge's preference. But it's not giving you the whole case. It's just giving you kind of an overview of the case. So, hey, this is a case that involves um, a neighbor suing another neighbor for a tree that fell after a storm. Or this is a case that involves, um, you know, the beating and the robbery of a little old lady. Things like that, just to kind of give you an overview of what's going on in the case. And then the lawyers ask questions to see if different people on the jury are going to be um, favorable or going to be able to sit and listen to the evidence without, um, you know, kind of having already formed all of the opinions and, and um, whether or not they're going to be able to listen and um, understand and um, be favorable for that case. Not everybody's cut out for every case, um, but um, the, the way that the lawyers know whether or not you're cut out for a case is um, by your answering their questions. So if they ask, um, you know, like if they, if I saw you sitting on the front, um, front row in my little old lady ex, um, example, and I say, you know, Mr. Um, Smith, I see that you live at home with your grandmother. Um, how old is your grandmother and, and are you guys really close? And if Mr. Smith goes on and on about how he loves his Grammy and he's lived with her his whole life and she's the best person and the most important person for him, I'm going to probably um, exclude him as a juror because I'm going to say he's probably not going to be able to listen with an open mind and um, determine whether or not this little old lady was was mistaken or was wrong when she accused my client of something bad against her. Um, after the um, part of jury selection where um, the questions are asked and there's a conversation and both sides have had the chance to engage in a conversation with the jury, then the attorneys for each side argue two things, strikes for cause and then peremptory strikes. So strikes for cause are when um, just the two lawyers, for each, one for each side and the judge, um, talk and say, you know, for example, I would say, I think juror number four is um, is not going to be able to listen to the evidence um, objectively and will not be able to, um, to follow the directions of the court and um, be an unbiased juror in this case. And then the other side would say, no, he can absolutely be unbiased. You just don't want him as a as a witness. He never said he wasn't going to um, disregard whatever the judge said. And so the judge would then say, okay, yes, this person is disqualified, or no, this person is not disqualified. Um, a lot of times when people are struck for cause, it's people that, um, for example, maybe cannot understand um, the language. Um, they're non-native um, speakers that maybe have only been in the United States for a short amount of time and don't speak English. or um, they say something like, I was a crime victim and I don't care what you say, nothing's going to change my mind that um, this person is not a crime victim. Or I hate corporations so much that no matter what you say, I'm going to always say that the corporation has to pay a bajillion dollars in a case. Um, those are things that are um, grounds for strikes for cause. Now, once all of the strikes for cause are um, argued and all of those people are kind of thrown out, 
then the judge allows um, each side to make what's called peremptory strikes. And the reason why strikes for cause are so important is because strikes for cause are unlimited. That's the judge saying, look, I agree that this person would not be able to um, provide truthful or good jury service in this case. And so I'm saying as a matter of law, this is not a good juror for this case. Um, and so those don't count, you know, as anything. They're just allowed unlimited. Um, peremptory strikes are limited by each side. So each side has a limited, you know, three or six or just depending on what the court has set. And so um, the more people that I can have stricken for cause, um, the fewer peremptory strikes I have to use on them. So if I, um, if I see that I have, um, you know, of the first 10 jurors that are seated on the front row, I have five of those people are little old ladies that I think are going to find um, my client was, was responsible for beating up a little old lady. Um, then I am going to want to argue a strike for cause because if I only have three peremptory strikes, I'm not going to be able to get rid of all those little old ladies on the front row. So, um, so that's why you want to argue strikes for cause versus peremptory strikes. But regardless, say all the little old ladies sitting still on the front row, um, I can issue my peremptory strikes and I can do them for any reason at all. I can do it because, um, you know, the little old lady was wearing a purple jacket and I think that purple jackets are um, a sign that somebody is too free of a thinker and I don't want them sitting on my jury. Something like that. That is perfectly fine. No reason at all. They laughed whenever you um, made a joke or they didn't laugh when you made a joke and you think that that you know they smirked at your client or something like that you can just any reason the only thing is you can't use a peremptory strike on somebody based on their race so you can't just strike all of the hispanic people and say that you know you're allowed to do that so anyway it's a lot probably more than you cared about strikes but um when you are called for jury duty, the only people that um, are um, really not considered for strikes are people that are quiet. So um, the more you talk, the more you, somebody will find something that they want to strike you for. Um, so after all the strikes are taken, the first 12 people who were not struck are the jury. So really, it's not jury selection. It's more like jury elimination. Who's left after everybody is stricken? Sometimes there are alternates chosen, um, especially, you know, in a time of, of coronavirus. If there is a jury trial, a lot of times they'll choose a ton of alternates because those people are sitting there and they listen to the whole case just as if they were a juror. Um, in case one of the jurors has to be excused. Um, and then if you're not chosen as a juror or an alternate, then you are dismissed. And sometimes you're promised that you won't be called back for a year or sometimes there's no promise or something like that. It's just um, kind of varies by county by county, depending on how many people in that county are available for jury service. So what does it take to be a juror? Well, you don't, um, your employer does not have to pay you when you're serving. So if you um, work at a coffee shop and you are being asked to serve on a trial that's going to last a year, um, your employer does not have to pay you at all for the time you're not working at the coffee shop. Um, the county will pay you per day, but it is usually just 
just a few dollars, like $5 or $12 or something like that. Um, you are almost never sequestered. So in, in um, kind of in movies, you'll see, well, the jury is sequestered at some secret location. Um, that doesn't really ever happen. They never, I mean, you just go home at the end of the day. You show up the next morning, you go home at the end of the day after court. Um, you cannot take a day off or be late. So if you um, have a surgery um, planned or a vacation planned, that's something that you talk to the judge about before you um, are chosen to be a juror. Um, you can't be late. So when they say court starts at nine o'clock, they mean nine o'clock. Nine o'clock, you gotta have your bumper in your chair. Um, not nine o'clock, get up and start trying to move towards the courthouse. Um, you must promise to listen to all the evidence and consider it and follow the judge's instructions regarding the law. So the judge is gonna tell you what the law is. It's not up for you to um, say, well, I think that's a dumb law, and so I'm going to find some other way because I don't agree with that law. It's not up to you. Um, if you want to change the law, you have to petition the legislature, which is something we talked about in the legislative um, section. Um, and then finally, you must promise to follow the judge's instructions regarding out-of-court behavior. So what does that mean? The judge will give you instructions and say things like, um, you can't talk to the lawyers. Um, so that means if you're sharing an elevator with one of the lawyers um, in the case, you can't say like, hey, how about that witness this afternoon? That is rough. I can't believe they were you know, so terrible. Nothing like that. You can't discuss the case with anyone out of court. So the day ends and you go home and your spouse says, well, how was your day in court? You can't say, oh my gosh, we, we heard somebody talk um, who was just the absolute worst. And, you know, I think that that person is terrible because the, um, the, your spouse could say, well, wait a second, let's talk about that. And let me let you reframe that. And let me um, give you another point of view. That's something that's not allowed. Um, you're not allowed to discuss among other jurors um, what you think about the case before the case ends. So you can't, you know, over lunch um, during day three, you can't say, oh, yeah, this guy's totally, totally guilty. There's no way he's going to be able to dig himself out of this hole or anything like that. You can't accept gifts um, from anybody. You can't do independent research, no Googling um, to see what, you know, what this company that's in being sued is responsible for, something like that. You can't um, share your personal experiences on the jury. So you can't say, well, one time when I was um, assaulted by somebody who looks like the defendant, this is what it was like. Um, you can't consider attorney's fees. Like you can't say, well, those attorneys look like they're making a lot of money. We better give um, the person a lot of money so they can pay for their attorneys. Um, you can't speculate about whether or not somebody's damages are being covered by insurance. Um, and you can't research the law. So you can't like ask your friend who's a lawyer, um, Hey, tell me all about, you know, assault and battery or something like that. Now, um, what is a qualification to be a juror? You have to be a U.S. citizen over 18 years old, a resident of the county where you're called. Um, you have to be qualified to vote. So all of the voter qualifications. You have to be able to read and write English. Um, you have not served. Um, for six days in the last six months if it's a district court case or within the last three months if it's a um, county court case. You have to be of sound mind and good moral character, not convicted of a felony or a misdemeanor theft, so a crime that shows you're dishonest, and you can't be under indictment yourself. 
Now, what are some ways that you can um, avoid serving on a jury? If you're over 70, you can be exempted. Um, now, if you're over 70 and you want to be on jury, you can. But if you're over 70, you can say, I'm too old to do this. Um, if you are the primary caregiver for a child who's under 12, so say you're a stay-at-home mom whose children do not go to daycare um, and your child is, is small, then um, you don't have to um, be on the jury. Um, if you're a high school or college student, um, you don't have to serve. Um, if you, and, and you're actually in school, you don't have to serve. If you are um, an officer or employee of the Senate or the House, it's just a perk. Um, if you served as a juror in the last 24 months, so that doesn't disqualify you, but you can say, look, I've already done my duty here. If you're the primary caretaker of someone else, um, so say you're caring for an infirm relative, um, you can opt out or if you have some sort of a medical condition that would prevent you from serving. So what does it take to um, be a judge? So you can either be elected or appointed, so it varies state by state. So some judges are chosen from a list suggested by a judicial commission, so a, a kind of a neutral commission. Um, this is called the Merit Plan or the Missouri Plan. Um, some states have partisan elections, some states have nonpartisan elections, and some states have appointments. Texas has partisan elections, um, and so, but you can see how everything varies greatly. And um, so, you know, when I talk to people in Maine, for example, or New York, they are surprised when I say, oh yeah, well, we voted for our judges because theirs are appointed. Um, and not subject to voter um, accountability. Um, most courts require that you be licensed to practice law. Um, not all courts, not in um, justice courts or in county courts, but in other courts you have to be licensed to practice law. Now, that doesn't mean you have to be a good lawyer. That just means that um, you have to be licensed. The unofficial qualifications in Texas are that you're likely going to be a white male. Um, you are going to need to have access to money for campaign contributions. Uh, I mean, for campaign expenses, because you're gonna be running as a partisan um, campaign. You have to have connections. Um, you have to be a member of the predominant party in your area. Um, very rarely does somebody just roll off the street um, practicing law, not knowing anybody, um, and be able to become a judge. You can see by the bar graph um, the underrepresentation and overrepresentation of certain um, groups. As usual in Texas, the white males are overrepresented and everyone else is underrepresented. Okay, so let's talk about the different courts we have in Texas. And um, if you're following along in the notes, we'll fill out the chart that's on um, page three of the notes. So in um, Texas, we have a Supreme Court and a Court of Criminal Appeals, and those are the highest courts in the land. So uh, both of those have nine judges. Both are elected in partisan statewide elections. So I vote on um, the same slate of judges as somebody in El Paso does, as somebody in Amarillo does. Um, everybody is is voting on, in the state, votes on the Supreme Court and the Court of Criminal Appeals justices. The qualification for both is they have to be a citizen of Texas and the United States, have to be between 35 and 74 years old. So as you can see, you can age out of being um, a Supreme Court or a Court of Criminal Appeals Justice. And you have to be a lawyer or a judge for a combined 10 years. So if I practiced law for six years, but I was a judge for four years, 
then I am eligible to run for either the Supreme Court or Court of Criminal Appeals. The term limit for both is six years. Now, um, all of those things are the same, except um, for the Court of Appeals, that is, there are 80 um, positions for judges in the Court of Appeals. Um, they are elected in partisan elections, not statewide, just in their appellate district. Um, there are 14 different appellate districts in Texas. So only the, I only elect um, appellate judges from my appellate district. Um, but again, it has to be a citizen of Texas in the U.S., 35 to 74 years old, and a lawyer or judge for a combined 10 years of service. And the term length is six years. Um, moving on to district courts, those are courts that um, are kind of the first stop for a lot of cases. There are 469 um, judges in Texas. There's one per court. Um, they are selected in partisan elections in their district. The judge must be 25 to 74 years old and um, a resident of the district for at least two years, must have practiced law um, or been a judge or both for a combined four years, and the term is a four-year term. Um, for county constitutional county courts, there are 254 counties in Texas, and so there are 254 constitutional county courts. Um, they are elected in partisan elections in the county. Um, so we, you know, if you live in Tarrant County, you only vote for the Tarrant County um, judge. They um, do not have a requirement that they're a lawyer. They just have to be well informed in the law of the state. That's the, that's the standard. Um, and then their term is four years. Um, statutory county courts or county courts at law are just additional courts within the counties. Um, there are 246 of those. Um, there are some counties that have multiple county courts at law and some that have zero. Um, they are elected, judges are elected in partisan countywide elections. Um, county courts at law Judges have to be at least 25 years old, have lived in the county for two years, and have four years experience as either a lawyer or a judge. And it's a four-year term. Um, there are 18 probate courts, so 18 probate judges. Um, they are elected um, in partisan elections um, in a, in a countywide election um, for the county where they are. Um, they have to be at least 25 years old, um, a resident of the county for two years, and um, have to have five years experience as either a lawyer or a judge. Um, and really, and, and they, they serve four-year terms. So you may be wondering why there's a countywide election and there's only 18 probate courts because that's you know far fewer probate courts than 254 counties in Texas these are more specialty courts so in smaller counties there are um, these these issues are handled either by the county court or the district court um, and they're not handled by a specialty probate court but then some places like in Tarrant County um, they need to have probate courts because there's just so many cases that they need somebody specialized to handle them. Um, justice courts or justice of the peace courts are, um, there are 802 of those and they are elected in um, precinct wide elections. Um, again, partisan elections. Um, there is no minimum qualifications and they serve a four year term. Um, and then municipal courts are, you know, municipal like city courts are, um, there are 936 of those. And they are um, either elected or appointed by the city, um, the city council. You have to just kind of look at the city charter to see how they're 
municipal courts are, um, or municipal judges are selected. Um, the city decides what kind of qualifications, so there may be no qualifications, there may be stringent qualifications, and they serve between two and four years. Now, the, the different, um, kind of as you go down this, um, down this list, you can see that the courts at the top have the most serious cases, the most serious jurisdiction. The um, qualifications are more stringent, but as you move down to um, courts that require, that, that hear cases um, that have less at stake, um, the qualifications are less. So when we talk about the court structure in Texas, really it would, you would start at the bottom when you file your case and then you would move your way up as you appeal. So um, if, and we'll, so let's start at the bottom of this um, chart in the notes. So if you have a case that is um, not very serious, less than $10,000, um, in a civil claim or some kind of a small claim. Um, there's a misdemeanor where there's only a fine that can be imposed, like a truancy um, issue, um, something like, you know, I um, ran over my neighbor's um, flower bed and they're gonna have to pay $3,000 to get the flower bed fixed, something like that then we can take this case to justice court. And um, those are just, you know, different precincts and the counties and um, the judges can hear that. Um, if there's some sort of a criminal misdemeanor like truancy, where there's only a fine available, um, some sort of a municipal ordinance that is being violated or um, some other municipal you know, issue, then you can take your case to municipal court. There are um, 938 um, municipal courts and there are um, or courts in 938 cities and they make up um, 1,326 different judges. So say that my case is a little more serious and um, it involves um, a probate issue or a guardianship issue, and I live in a county where there is a um, probate court, then I can go to one of those 18 probate courts, go to one of those 18 probate judges, and have my, court, my case heard there. Um, if I don't live somewhere where there is a, a probate court, then I could go to either the um, constitutional county court or the statute, statutory county court. Um, the constitutional county court, again, there's 254 courts, 254 judges. Um, the statutory county courts, 246 courts with 246 judges. The um, statutory county courts here, um, civil, um, I'm sorry, here, whatever cases, civil or criminal, um, that are um, established by law, so civil cases um, where the amount in controversy is between $200 and $200,000, um, and they also hear cases that maybe were first heard in the justice court or the municipal court, and um, somebody thinks that they didn't get a fair shake in one of those courts, and so they can be appealed up and just heard straight from the beginning um, as a brand new kind of trial in, a, in either a statutory county court or a constitutional county court. Now the constitutional county courts, again, 254 of those, one in each county. Um, the amount in controversy, so the amount somebody is suing over, has to be between $200 and $10,000. They also hear probate issues, misdemeanors with over a $500 fine, um, and then appeals from the justice courts. And then um, a district court, again, a case can be filed for the very first time in a district court. There are 469 of those with 469 judges. 
the amount has to be something over $200, but also could be a divorce, a probate issue, um, a title issue, like title to land, um, title to a piece of equipment, um, could be a contested election um, case, felony criminal cases, juvenile cases, all these things can be um, filed in the district court um, as the first place that the case is heard. Um, some counties have multiple district courts, some have only a few, some have um, none. Um, some counties have district courts that are only criminal or only civil. And then some counties have um, district courts that hear everything. So, um, you know, in Tarrant County, we have district courts that hear only um, family law cases. We have district courts that hear only civil cases, some that hear only criminal cases. But then in my little county where I grew up, Hood County, which is in Granbury, um, there's not very many people that live there and there's just one court and that judge hears everything. He may hear a divorce today, he may hear a murder case tomorrow, he may hear a, um, you know, a land dispute the next day. Um, so that's district courts. They can vary a lot. Um, then if you are either at the county level court or a district court and you feel like you did not get a fair treatment from the court, um, then there can be an appeal to the Court of Appeals. Um, the Court of Appeals, there are 14 different courts, 14 different appellate districts within Texas. So every part of Texas is within some appellate um, district and there are 80 justices. Um, they are the intermediate appellate court from um, the trials between the district court, the trial court and the Supreme Court or Court of Criminal Appeals. Now, if you are tried for a capital offense in district court and um, you are found guilty and sentenced to death, you skip the Court of Appeals and you go straight to the Court of Criminal Appeals because you don't want to waste your time. Um, appealing the case to the Court of Appeals and then have to get to the Court of Criminal Appeals. Everybody else has to go through the Court of Appeals because a lot of cases can be resolved by the Court of Appeals um, to the satisfaction of everyone. Um, now, if you are, um, if you have a case that was appealed um, and handled by the Court of Appeals and you were not satisfied, you lost and you were not satisfied um, by the result, then you can either appeal the case if it's a civil case where there's no, um, no incarceration or death penalty involved, um, you would appeal your case straight to the Supreme Court. Um, this is, you know, there's one Supreme Court in Texas. There are nine different Supreme Court justices. And so they hear appeals from civil and juvenile cases. Um, if you had a criminal case and you did not like the treatment at the Court of Appeals, then you would appeal your case to the Court of Criminal Appeals. Um, again, one court, nine justices, and they only handle criminal cases. And this is something weird in Texas, um, that we have two highest courts of the land. So, um, and, and you know what, every state has a lot of different names for all these different intermediate courts and um, trial courts. And so um, you kind of just never can tell unless you really are acquainted with the, the justice system in that court, what is the court of final appeal, what is the court of intermediate appeal, things like that. Now, appeals, again, from the Justice and Municipal Courts go to the county courts to be tried de novo. And what that means is um, as new or from the very beginning. So it's tried as if there's never been a trial before. Um, and so the um, county courts will hear evidence and they will um, basically be just giving a do-over to the trial. 
um, appeals from the county and district courts go to the appellate court, and that's where you see um, no witnesses, no evidence, only the record of the, the trial being considered. Um, death penalty cases, like I said, appealed straight to the Court of Criminal Appeals. And um, appeals from the Court of Appeals go to the Supreme Court in civil cases, juvenile cases, and the Court of Criminal Appeals in criminal cases. So let's talk a little bit about the death penalty. Um, Texas reinstated the death penalty in 1982 after the Supreme Court um, of the United States had reinstated it um, in 1976. So there was a little bit of time that the Supreme Court of the United States found that um, the death penalty was cruel and unusual and unconstitutional. But after the Supreme Court reversed that course um, in 1976, the um, Texas um, reinstated the death penalty in 1982. So the death penalty is, um, it's also capital, um, capital punishment um, is the same thing. The death penalty is a potential punishment if a person commits a capital crime. So it's not just for um, any crime, it's for certain kinds of crimes. So murder of a police officer, um, that you know the person was a police officer and they were on duty. Um, murder of a child who is younger than 10. Murder in the course of commission of another crime, like kidnapping, burglary, aggravated assault, which means um, hurting somebody with a, with a weapon. Um, arson, obstruction um, or retaliation, um, terroristic threat, any of those things that um, are being, any of those crimes being committed and then a murder also results, then um, that is a capital offense. Murder for hire is a capital offense. Um, murder of a judge as retaliation is a capital offense. And there are others, they're just, it's in, um, you have to just look at the actual um, statute. Um, since 1982, Texas has executed 565 people. Actually, it's um, between 1982 and October 1st, 2019. So I haven't updated that figure um, over the last year. So Texas has executed 565 people between that time. Now the information regarding people who are executed um, is publicly available. So you can know when somebody was executed and how old they were and, and their race and where they were from and things like that. Um, this is a way for, you know, um, people to keep up with what happened. Um, for example, one of, um, a girl that I knew from college was, um, brutally raped and murdered, um, when somebody was broke into her house, um, and, and did that after she got off of work one day. Um, and I never really heard what happened, but then I was able to find the people who were charged with her crime and see that yes, in fact, those people had been um, executed. And I could even see, you know, what their um, information about them was, what happened, what, you know, the crime they were charged with, what their last statement was, things like that. When you think about crime statistics and you think about um, everything you hear on the news about um, criminals and, um, you know, hardened criminals, you um, wonder what ethnic group has the largest percentage of executed prisoners in Texas. Well, that data is also available. And um, it turns out that most executed prisoners in Texas are white. Um, smaller percentage is black, smaller even than that is Hispanic, and then finally there's really only been two from 1982 to 2019 who were um, what would be classified as other. So um, of the 565, 251 of the executed have been white, 204 black, um, 108 Hispanic, and two other. Now, this is not 100%. I had a student in a previous um, class that, a previous TCC um, government class, that 
said, I know one of those people. He was classified as white and he wasn't white. He was, you know, Hispanic or he was something else. Um, so I'm not saying that these statistics are 100 percent accurate because um, but this is what is listed um, as a record in um, in the, you know, kind of the statistics of Texas. So that is all I am going to say now about um, the legislative, I'm sorry, the judicial branch of the Texas government. And um, I could give 10 more um, lectures on this, but I think that you guys would be bored to death probably. So um, I um, wish you luck on your um, exam. And um, if you have any questions, as always, um, please feel free to let me know.